Episode 81, Interview with Cooking Guru, Jamie Galler, Part 2. Welcome to the First Year Married Podcast, where we get real about building the marriage of your dreams. I'm marriage coach Kayla Levin, and I take newly married and engaged women from anxious and insecure to confident and connected through practical tips, real life inspiration, and more than a little self-awareness along the way. Welcome back, my friends. Picking up from last week, we are continuing with the conversation with Jamie Geller. She spoke a lot last week about finding some inspiration and fun and kind of how to manage if cooking can be overwhelming and stressful, definitely listen to that if that speaks to you, if that's something that you feel like you're struggling with. But this week, we actually shifted gears and spoke about two very different topics. So I'm excited for you to hear what we have to talk about today. First, I asked Jamie to share a little bit about her entrepreneurship journey. As you know, if you heard the first part, she actually, when she got married, she was a producer at HBO, living a very successful professional life. And now she has jamiegeller.com, Jewish by Jamie, and all sorts of cookbooks and offers and all sorts of things going on in her business. I wanted to ask this because I know that some of you reach out to me about questions about entrepreneurship and starting your own business. So I know it's something you're interested in, and I really thought it would be valuable to have Jamie talk about it. But at the same time, I think hearing her discuss finding your passion, finding your voice in the world, whether it's entrepreneurship or anything else, you're going to really gain something from that conversation. I also asked Jamie to share a little bit about her Aliyah journey, her decision with her family to move to Israel, why she decided to do that, what were the challenges that came up for them, what was the inspiration for them? And I also really, really enjoyed that part as well. So enjoy. Finally, you'll get some advice for newlyweds. And one big mistake that she and I both made when we were first married. So enjoy. You've modeled a lot of things for us beyond just your cooking. And one of them would be entrepreneurship. And so many women, I feel like, are stepping into entrepreneurial space. I have people reaching out to me saying, I think I kind of want to do the sort of thing that you do, or I think I want to start my own business. For listeners who are thinking about building their own businesses, I was wondering if you would speak to what factors you think they should consider before making that leap. First of all, there's a lot to consider. And then there's something to be said for just going for it. Okay, so we're going to talk about two sides of the coin right now. Obviously, they're all the normal factors that you hear about when you're about to launch a business. Is there a need? Is there an audience? What is your market differentiator? What are you bringing that's you know different uh, to the space? What is your specific niche, angle, or voice um, or perspective that's going to resonate with people? And that doesn't always mean that the business has to have you front and center in front of camera. It just means that like you're speaking in some way that the brand and the business has a voice because people want to be part of something, a story and, you know, part of a community and part of a movement that's, you know, going to make their lives easier, better, or, you know, do social good or some other, yeah, you know, some other effort. So all those things are like sort of the standard business advice. Make sure you work out the numbers before you start. Make sure you understand profit margins. Make sure you have, uh, you know, a, a nice enough money, you know, to invest, allow you. It takes time to build a business. And it could take years to break even depending on what the business is. So do you have that financial cushion to allow you to build it without burning out and without feeling the financial strain? Because we all know when there is financial strain, it is so hard to be your best, to be creative and to give all, all your all to something when you're concerned about, you know, paying the bills this month and putting food on the table. How can you build a business under that duress? So those are all the classic things you have to think about. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes we have to have passion and we have to just believe in ourselves and we have to just go forward because I have to tell you, even for my own self and so many other business ideas that I never launched or half-heartedly launched or whatever, like if you don't try, you don't succeed. And you can sit there and you can crunch the numbers and you can strategize from here tomorrow and you can have mentors and you can have advisors and you could be studying the marketplace and boom, someone else like <laughs> did what you, what you were thinking in the meantime, you know, when you lost that, that chance, you lost that opportunity and you know, if, if the time in your life is right, sometimes you just also have to take a bit of a plunge too. So mm, I love that answer. All right. We undervalue our own passion for things, I think, mm-hmm. right? Like I would never want to be helping people with cooking. 
but I'm so glad that you do because that helps me a lot. Right. And it's so easy to be like, well, I don't know. I feel like one of a million, but the thing that we're passionate about is often pretty unique. And so I love that, that double side. Thank you. And even within your niche, there might be one in a million, but nobody is you. There's nobody. We're one in a million yet. We all have a unique thumbprint, right? So we all have a unique voice and you were created for the world to hear that voice. And whether that means on a grand scale in terms of a business or whether your world is your family, your friends and your neighbors and something local, like, you know, and it doesn't have to be a business, your voice, but like you shouldn't stifle that thing, which can, that you're passionate about because often it's, it's needed. We've got so many quotes we got to put up from this interview. Thank you. <laughs> These are amazing. Oh, cool. Well, okay. every time people ask for quotes, I have no clue what to say, but I'm going to be so happy if you found something within Yes. Me. <laughs> oh my gosh. So many. We'll send them all your way. Cool. So another question that I get a lot is why we moved to Israel. We moved here. We made Aliyah last summer. And when you made Aliyah, you made a whole video series. And it's so funny because it didn't even occur to me until I came across some conversation or maybe the comments on the series right before we moved. Because I sort of felt like that, like nobody could possibly be as inspired and connected to that story as me. Like that, that whole series existed for me in my head until I saw all these other people saying like, this inspired me. It pushed us to keep our dream alive and all these things. I was like, wait, you too? Like, you're in on my party. <laughs> it um, was for you, Kayla. It was for you. Oh, thanks. So you know. It yeah. did the job. That's for sure. So it was obviously a very major inspiration for me. And then when I shared it with my husband, it, it meant a lot for him also. And when I needed that booster shot of encouragement, like, you know, it took us 10 years of trying every, trying to find a way over and over for 10 years before we were able to make Aliyah. So with this question that I'm getting, like, so, okay, clearly this was a dream come true. This is something you really wanted to do, but why? I'm curious to hear from you a little bit about what some of the factors might have been for you and or advice that you might give someone who's considering Aliyah. When I was younger, I always wanted to live in Israel. And I think the way we spoke about that, like cooking was not in my DNA. So wanting to live in Israel is in my DNA. And obviously it's in my DNA all the way back to our forefathers, you know, and foremothers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, right? So this is something that's been a yearning for the Jewish soul since the beginning of time. And but more specifically in recent history, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors and they always wanted to move to Israel. And it was very hard to get out of, um, they lived in Transylvania. So it was Hungary before the war in Romania, after the war. It was very hard to get out and to get to Israel. And some of their siblings had made it to Israel and they said to them, it's so hard to make a living here go to America first, go for a few years, make some money, and then you'll come join us here in Israel. Because financially it was hard, it's hard to find jobs. And so my grandparents survived the war, were married after the war. My parents were born in Europe after the war in Transylvania, and they went to America for a few years, and then they were gonna go join all their family in Israel. And of course they never did. You know, it's hard when you get into America and you start making a living and you start like becoming part of the culture and raising your kids there, and then they marry other people there. and so there it went, you know, so it was like an unrealized dream for my grandparents and to my parents. My parents always loved Israel and they used to take us here all the time. And I fell so in love with it that every time I'd come, I'd say, I want to live here. I want to be here. And, you know, but then I go to NYU and I get a job. I'm like a TV producer. I work for CNN. I work for HBO. It's so hard to leave. I have friends and then, you know, my pet parents are there. I get married. I start having kids and it's like, You don't want to separate from your family at those crucial times in life when you want, whether it's their support or just the joy of raising your kids with grandparents who are local. My husband had said to me on our first date to live in Israel. And I said to him, you know, sure, I'd love, in quotes, to live there too, you know, in theory. But, you know, if you really want to move there, you know, go find yourself another girl. Because here, my career is soaring. You know, I was a producer at HBO. My family was there. I had so much, lived such a luxurious life financially and such a secure life financially in America. And I wanted to, at that point in my life, even though I had had this yearning, it had been stifled. And I really was like, oh, I'll visit Israel. I'll support Israel. Maybe even one day we'll be so financially successful that we can have a second apartment in Jerusalem overlooking the Kotel, the Western Wall, you know, like that's it. But like, do I want to live in Israel? Like, no, at that time in my life, I just was like, no, it's not for me now. And my husband worked on me like water on a rock. 
And for eight years, he just kept saying, this is where we need to be. And it was his dream. It was his dream. And he, even though it was all of our dreams, like I had, I'd had this dream, my parents had had this dream, my mother had, and my grandparents had had this dream. I just kind of pushed it down with all the materialism and all the excitement and all the, the opportunity that the you know land of America has to offer. And I just had quieted the dream to the point that like, I just, um, I, I couldn't connect with actually doing it at that time in my life. And my husband just wouldn't give up. He wouldn't give up. And so then I came around to feeling like, okay, I understand it intellectually. I understand that the Jewish people need to be in their homeland. I understand the love and the desire of the soul of a Jewish person to live here. But practically, I don't want to leave the luxury that I have. We had a huge home at the time. Um, we I had uh, what my kids look at when they look back at the videos. Like we lived in a park, you know, because <laughs> we had a swing set. We had a swing set in our backyard and like, a, you know, a half an acre. And we were thinking about putting it in an in-ground pool, you know. And I just, you know, it's hard practically to separate myself from everything that we had. But around us, like people started moving. The people we bought our home from had made Aliyah. Then my brother and sister-in-law made Aliyah. And then my other brother and sister-in-law made Aliyah. And suddenly, which is very uncommon, but suddenly we were sitting around the holiday table with like my mother and my stepmother-in-law, knowing that all of our siblings and uh, all of our kids' first cousins were enjoying these like beautiful family meals and experiences with, with kids and contemporaries and cousins. So usually most people are leaving that. And we, our family, I guess because it was ingrained in our DNA, had been slowly making one family at a time, four, five, six kids, and, you know, each with four, five, six kids going. And we felt like there was really nothing left for us in America. We were alone which is very uncommon, like I said, that, that, and so when we decided to make Aliyah and go, we wanted to go when our kids were young enough to like make that acclimation smooth for them. We basically had like two, three people saying goodbye to us in the airport in America and we landed and there were like 50 people greeting, waiting for us, like cousins and even extended cousins, like my mother's cousins, the ones who were the children of the parents who said, go to America for a few years, make some money. They came to greet us. Like wow. three generations later, you're finally realizing this dream. It's like, they were so happy waiting with signs, crying for us to return. And I just feel like we returned home. It's, a, it's really a return home. And it's the realization of a longing of a dream of thousands of years uh, for the Jewish soul. And if people can really connect with their soul, I always say there's almost no one who lands in Israel, Jewish or non-Jewish alike, that their soul is not touched. You know, you have to be like spiritually dead in order not to feel the, what we say in Hebrew, the Kedusha, the spirituality of this land and this place and the purpose and the meaning that it represents. And that's it. It's like in a very deep spiritual, spiritual place that we made Aliyah from that place. Wow. I'm so glad that you shared where you were coming from too, because I think that sometimes it can seem like the people who make Aliyah are all people who just are like die hard, always inspired, always completely in line with this idea that this is where they wanted to be. And the truth is that, yeah, for some of us, it takes more stepping back, getting connected to ourselves. It's a process. I know at one point before, when we were making the decision, we decided look, let's like literally just do a pros and cons list and just see what goes on it. And then when we did all of our reasons for staying in America, we were like, we don't like those reasons. Like, we don't want those to be the reasons that drive us. So even though there was, I think that list was even longer, it wasn't the way that we wanted to identify. It wasn't the things that we wanted to, to make our decision for us. So in a way, it's a little bit similar to what you're saying. Very much so. Very much so. Wow. Well, okay. So final question is, Ooh. if you could, what would you tell newlywed Jamie? It's the same thing I would tell Jamie today, if I'm going to speak myself in the third person, to be kinder to yourself. I just feel like there are a lot of failures along the way. There are a lot of challenges along the way. There are a lot of struggles along the way. They're emotional, they're mental, they're spiritual. Some of them are you know, physical and professional. They're personal, they're in interpersonal in terms of the relationships that we have, whether it's husband to wife or, you know, uh, us parents to pe in-laws or parents to child and they just don't stop they always take different forms 
And we're just when you've conquered one, another one presents itself. That's part of growth. That's why we're here on this earth. And to beat yourself up over the perceived mistakes or missteps, it just puts you into a deeper hole, right? And so I think that I remember, I'll take it as a lightest, like, because we're talking so intensely, a simple, light example. I made meatloaf for the first time and it was a disaster and it kind of fell apart and it never became the loaf. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to serve it. I was so embarrassed and I felt like such a failure. And I, I was so, such a, um, I had such an accomplished professional career as this TV producer. I'd done so much in the world and like, I can't even make a meatloaf. And I was like on the floor, like, like literally in tears, like I was mourning, like someone had died. And my husband, you know, picked me up and he's like, and we're going to serve it. And he said, you know, he said, I, he said, either we'll say that he made it. He was really to take the fall for me. He didn't want me to waste. Or he said, we're going to like call it. We're going to mush it up more. And it's going to be like a chopped meat dish, you know, <laughs> like, you know, and so it's, you know, things like that, like we can put ourselves in such a hole, you know, and I was literally like on the floor, like mourning over meatloaf. And I've done that with things that I may have said wrong, whether it's to family, to in-laws, whether it's things, ways that I've dealt wrongly with my husband, nothing, nothing, nothing is the end of the world. And so that meatloaf wasn't the end of the world. That fight that I had with my husband was not the end of the world. You know, everything, if, if we let ourselves sort of wallow in that misery and we're not kind to ourselves and all we do is relive the mistakes and the failure and the disaster, then we just get so much deeper in the hole. It's so much harder to climb out of it. But if we take it, you know, we're kinder to ourselves and allow ourselves to have made the missteps or the mistakes, then we just, we conquer, we fix, we move on and we go to the next thing <laughs> because that's, that's how it goes. And I think we just have to be kinder to ourselves. It will allow us to, to face each challenge with a lot more energy and a lot more passion and positivity toward growth. Wow. I know that that is something that we all need to hear, possibly on repeat every morning as we wake up. <laughs> totally. I can't wait to hear the podcast. It's so good. Because like I said, I'm talking to myself now. Right. Right. Yeah. We, we all need it. Maybe you can like cut in a little MP3 and make it like a morning alarm clock app, you know? <laughs> be nice totally, to totally. I'm going to wake up to be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. You know, I remember what I first learned about affirmations when I teased the SAT tutor said, like you write what you want to achieve and put it up on the, uh, stick it to your mirror in the morning. So when you're brushing your teeth and doing your makeup and getting ready for the day, like you see that. So yeah, we need that a little on the alarm clock. Uh, right. Be good to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Can I share with you Nothing my, is first, like my first embarrassing food botch? Yeah, please. Since you shared meatloaf. So the very first time we had a guest, we were in our first year of marriage. And so we weren't having guests, but then we just one night decided just to sort of like test the waters. We had a good friend who was a single guy, just one person. It's fine. Mm -hmm. So I made matzo ball soup and I still don't know what I did wrong. But it was sort of like a oatmeal with chicken in it. <laughs> matzo balls just disintegrated. <laughs> oh my god and just oh created like this I'm like, like... <laughs> and they literally the two my husband and his friend who are both just sterling you know personal developed like personally developed people ate every last drop asked for seconds they were like this is even better it was not <laughs> it was not but it was so sweet well, so first of all, you got yourself a keeper with a husband like that, uh, no sure. question. And second of all, how how special of that guy. I love that of your guest. Yeah. And you know what? Maybe it was better. I'm going to look at, well, we'll, so you know what we'll call it? Deconstructed matzo balls, okay? And we'll look at seeing that perhaps that sort of chunky texture may appeal to some people. I, like I guess so. <laughs> It's like I always say that my mom, mommy blackens things sometimes, but I never burn them. I love burnt food. I love everything well done, by the way. I'm not even joking. And I love that blackened. I'm Just done. Blackened. I love it. I'm, I'm stealing it. Totally. Of course. Done. Very posh. And everyone listening yeah, can steal it too. Yeah, right, right. These are things that we want to steal and give to the world. So the deconstructed anytime a dish falls apart, the blackened anytime something is a little bit well done. Yeah, done. And but then what awesome. is it called when something's not really cooked? Uh, seared, right? Okay, so instead seared, of raw, so if it's <laughs> it was seared. Yeah. Right. You, we meant to deliver a seared chicken, even though it's slightly dangerous to eat raw chicken. <laughs> meat, yes. Meat and fish can be seared. Chicken better not, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. I cannot thank you enough. I mean, I was really looking forward to this interview, but this is like 
you blew my mind beyond, beyond what I was hoping to be able to share with our audience. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I know that people are going to want to be following you. So you shared a little bit about that. I guess I was going to ask you again, but jamiegeller.com. And then of course, please sign up for my free newsletter. I love it. That's where we get to connect like on a weekly or daily basis, your choice. And then on all social media, we are at Julish by Jamie. And we have a second handle at Jamie Geller. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, it was amazing. It was a great interview and I cannot wait to hear it, see it and share it. Okay, my friends, I hope you really enjoyed that interview. I have a lot of amazing, super fun interviews lined up for you this summer. So you know what? If you have some friends that you think could use some good listening material right now, some inspiration, some connection, I want to really encourage you to let them know. Share this podcast. So many of you got here because a friend or a sister told you about this podcast, and I just really love that this becomes such a beautiful community. And if you've been on the fence about joining the First Year Married community, or if you're new here and you don't even know what that is, I have a six-week online course that makes marriage work fun. (laughs) So many times I come across marriage workshops and marriage coaches and stuff, and it just feels very heavy. This is fun. This is enlightening. This is motivating and really, really enjoyable work. And I want to invite you to join us inside that community. On top of the six-week course, which you have lifetime access to, we have regular Zoom Q&A calls. You can even submit anonymous questions ahead of time to get your questions answered. The amount of support and inspiration that I'm hearing from you all that you get from those calls and the inspiration from hearing what other people are going through and really truly understanding how all this material can apply in any situation is really phenomenal. And I want to invite anyone who's on the fence to join us. You can sign up super easy at firstyearmarried.com and I look forward to seeing you inside. Be well.